Sorry, folks, we've just got um, a little problem with the microphone on it now. There we are. That sounds like it might be better. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Woodworking Wisdom Workshops. I, didn't, I hope I didn't put you off there with my attempt at dancing. Um, here we are again, another another week, um, another live session, um, and we're on the cusp of Easter. So your suggestions, the, again, one of your suggestions uh, was to make some uh, wooden flowers. So I thought, well, why not? Let's do it. Let's couple up with Easter, nice spring flowers, that sort of thing. These are really, really colorful um, gifts, I suppose, and it's an alternative to chocolate. Um or and as well as chocolate, if you wanted to give some eggs and something maybe a little bit different, you still got plenty of time to um, create your own. Now I've got just four tulips that I made earlier, literally earlier today, actually. Um, but we're going to have a go at some uh, heel cut skew, uh, some skew heel cut uh, flowers as well, now, which I've done with, with you many times before, um, and is out there on lots of demonstrations and stuff. But we're going to start with these. So these are lovely. We're using Chromacraft colours, as in the wood dyes. And um, I've just made some little stems out of dowel. We'll go through the dowel uh, in a second. But, yeah, they're fun projects, really. So let's get stuck straight into this. Don't forget, you know, normal thing. If, you've, if you're new to the channel, if you're new to these streams, then use the chat. Um, ben is monitoring chat. And uh, we'll ask us questions. And just just a little bit of information before we carry on any further. It's only me and Ben today. We don't have support from the rest of the Axminster team. They are out doing other things. So in terms of stock queries and all those sorts of things, um, just we'll help where we can. But if you leave the question in the chat or on, or best to uh, send it to Woodworking Wisdom, our email address, um, then we'll answer them for you um, tomorrow. Okay, so all right, let's get started. So we're going to, I'm going to start with some really, really pale ash. So here's my ash. Now, in terms of colored timbers, it you can use what you want in terms of timbers, but if you're going to add color, start with something that's pale already. So start with so, so the whiter timbers. This is pale ash, sycamore, uh, maple, those sorts of materials, because you know what happens, because the the wood turning, um, sorry, the the stains or the dyes are what we call transparent. Any color that's on the base will um, change the the color that you apply over the top. So if we start with something white, the true color comes through of that wood dye. Um, you don't have to use dyes. You can keep um, the color of the timber shining through if you want to. So if you want to use colored timbers, for instance, um, then do that. Now, my, the demonstration today is not my own demonstration. Um, I looked at um, Carl Jacob Jacobson um, and his wood turning channel. I just searched wood turned uh, wooden flowers, and he done a great demonstration of these. So this is my interpretation of his demonstration, and I think that's the woodshop.com. I, I, I might be wrong on that one, um, but it's Carl Jacobson or Jacobson. Um, check that out as well. Really, really good demonstration. So I'm just doing my little bit to to recreate what he was showing. Okay. Yes, we've got another question, or first question, sorry. So um, first question from Sol here, Cole, and I think you might have just touched on it. Um, he finds that he used the, the chestnut, chestnut spirit stain red um, and is coming out more of a brown. Um, any suggestions on how to get a more vibrant red? Right. If that's the case, what I, I'm going to assume that you've used the airbrush before for other colours. Because what it sounds like is you're getting a little bit of contamination from another color, maybe black or something. If it's a new airbrush, new bottle and things like that, and the first time you've used the red, then I have no explanation for it. Because the chestnut spirit red should be a vibrant, um, real primary red. So um, I wouldn't have an explanation apart from contamination. I know that because it's happened to me before. Um, I've used a yellow uh, that I've used that I uh, previously had uh, a black in. So you, you've got to be quite careful. Any of the slightest little bit of residue from a previous color will contaminate, even if you think it's dry, even if you've washed it out. Um, you've got to be careful with that. 
Um, and remember not to mix up your spirits and your your acrylics either because they it's like oil and water. They will not mix, and you can really mess airbrushes up if you mix the, the, the types up. All right, so be careful. I suggest that's what's happened. Yes. Yeah, so he's just put in the comments. Uh, Sol's put in the comments. Um, he had blue in there before and thought he'd cleaned it. That's what it is, yeah. yeah. Um, I use the chestnut spirit stains a lot, and that red comes out really nice. Real vibrant, isn't it? Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. So there's it's a little bit of a delay on the lips. Apologies for that. It's probably where we've um, uh, hooked up the microphone. <laughs> we, we've literally are absolutely apologise because we've literally come straight out of doing a recorded video that you're going to be seeing next week um, in making the, the Nick Hagar Viking Sunset Bowls. So it's now how to make those. And we've literally finished 10 minutes ago doing that and we're straight into the stream. So there may be a little bit of a, a delay for that for whatever reason. I don't know. So apologies. I'll try and catch up with my voice. Right, ready. Let's. Um, so, no, white ash, pale colours. The, the true colour comes through of the dye. Then, what we're going to do first, and make make yourself a bundle of these. Don't just do one of them. You you want to have a bunch of flowers if you're going to give them away. Um, I've just moved, put this between centres, roughly centred up. We're going to start with the roughing gouge, round to centre, round to centre, turn down to a round. It's the trouble when you're you're speaking too much in demonstrations. You end up just talking rubbish half the time so we're going to rough down to a cylinder there we are i'm only going to do one for you because of obviously time and you don't want to see me doing loads and loads and loads um so I'm only going to prep one piece up, but I've got three or four pieces down here. But we've also got some smaller pieces as well, which we're going to be playing around with and doing some heel cuts. So I'm going to prep this up to hold in my O'Donnell jaws, my 112s, as they're called. And let, if I can just briefly show you what that looks like. There's an OD112. I'm going to make a little dovetail um, foot here just to grip into. Yes, Ben. Um, so there's a question from Catherine. We um, we discussed it just quickly before we went on live about um, the church goblets um, oh, about yes. taking communion wine. Um, only to be used once. Only to be used once. Okay. Um, I, I'd have to research. I, I've seen, if you're going to turn goblets anyway, um, so oak's been traditionally used for goblets for a long, long time, and you can make them waterproof by um, uh, heat treating them. The exact how-to, I don't know. Um, so you have to search that up. The same way you would um, heat treat an oak barrel for, for winemaking, that sort of stuff. Look up how, how to do that. I've never done it myself. I'm unsure. A great turner, Joe Laird, he makes uh, whiskey goblets out of oak, and he does that that process by heat treating it with, with, uh, with fire. Um, check that out. Have a look at that. Um, whether there's any um, religious significance in a particular timber, I'm not sure, but I was things like olive springs to mind, like oak, like I, I'm said there, uh, chestnut maybe. Um, but yeah, I'd have to research it. Any any timber you can, you know, you can use it once. Um, you'd need to check out allergies. So things like you and laburnum, those sorts of things, I would stay away from because they're known to be um, poisonous. Um, so just do your research on which particular timber you, you use. Like I say, things like oak, I know a, a farm because they've been used for centuries in, in drinking vessels. So that sort of thing, I would say. And then this from Martin, he's um, asking you, please could you remind him what the angle of the bevel on your signature skew was? Uh, so they come, they should come as 25 degrees. That's your sort of, um, you know, the the the, the the starter angle, but you can bring them further back, sort of 20, 15 degrees. The better you get with a skew, the the finer the angle, the uh, better the finish will be, and the 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 sharper you can get them. However, the sharper the angle, also the more aggressive they become. So to start with, start at 25 degrees, and then just gently, every now and again, just bring them back a little bit further. Yes. And Clive's asking about the um, the starting measurements of the blank. For this one, yep. so really random. I mean, they're they're roughly fifty mil, so roughly two inches, uh, two by twos. Um, and what if I cut them to? I'll just cut what looks right. That one's four and three quarter inches. That one's five inches. 
so we're probably looking at 120 mil ish um but i've probably gone a little bit extravagant with the length of these we don't really need the whole of this length i always have a, a little waist piece um here's from one of the pieces that i've done earlier so you can see i could probably lose another 10 mil off of that piece there um but yeah so roughly that sort of four to five inches long by about two by two for this size you know for those that makes um that sort of size of flower the more sort of realistic um realistic sort of size you know um, what a real tulip would look like in terms of size wise we're gonna be really small though in a minute with some with other types of flower right so there we are so we we roughed down this and uh, we're just gonna make a little detail so just a little cut there let's use the parting tool just to make sure that contact area is true There we are. So I would make, I don't know, make as many as you want. If you're into craft fairs, selling in shops, selling, uh, you know, wherever, then make a bundle of the things, you know, they, you, I don't know what you would charge for them, but uh, they're, they're color, they're uh, a draw, they're an interest, get people over to your stand sort of thing. Um, they're lovely little gifts for the family as well everybody's got a bowl no one wants the bowl well certainly my family don't anyway but um so we're always trying to find something different as gifts and it doesn't you know just the fact that it's easter and the fact that i've blatantly used easter as an excuse to do these you don't have to any time of year and this is just one type of flower that we're playing around with again there's loads out there do some dafts in a minute, some daffodils. There we are. So in between centers, just because we can, we'll use the tailstock to support at the moment. Make sure everything's nice and tight. I'm going to go for a one quarter inch or six mil bowl gouge. There we are. And I'm going to drop the handle down and we're just going to skew cut with the bowl gouge just to get down to that final round. I want to go up in speed a little bit. So there we are, 17. Seventeen hundred. Let's do I've got two types of two types of um flower here. One that's one that's um closed, it's just coming out of bud. And the other one that's just opening up now. Okay, so I think we'll do this one. They're, they are, they're made in exactly the same way, just different external shapes, that's all. Okay, so we do them exactly the same. And let's get that rough shape in. So those petals are opening up. So we're going to have a little recess here, a little cove. And then the back. Don't go too small too soon at this point. Because this whole thing's going to be hollowed out in a minute. So you don't want to lose strength and get too much vibration. There we are. That should be fine. I'm going to use, let's go for my spindle gouge. I'm going to just round this back end over. And at the moment, that's enough. I'm not going to go any further than that because, like I said, we'll end up getting too much vibration in there. So let's go around to the front. We're going to hollow this out. Um, there's no point making things hard for ourselves, so we're going to drill this. Let's just take that away. Take the center out. We'll add a drill chuck. Mark how deep we need to go. So this is a, a little keyless chuck. 
And I've got a 20 mil drill bit. Use whatever size is going to suit um, the flowers you're making, of course. This is 20 mil. It's nice and nice and small. It's not in the way. I've already put a pencil mark. It looks as though it's going to be about right. So we're going into that depth. Okay, so just shy of the bottom. Then I can round the bottom over. So the inside looks nice as well. In fact, let me just show you. In one of these finished ones, we'll show you the inside. The only thing that you can see in there um, is the little stem. We angles. There's a little stem. You can't even see that. It's a bit dark inside, but there. So we want to have a nice round bottom. Um, of course, you could put stamen inside if you want to. Nice, easy bit of turning, different colour maybe. Um, that would look good. Lays me down a little bit for drilling. Let's just find my pencil mark. Sorry, my head's in the way a minute. There we are. There we are. I'm not going to drill all in one hit because the drill bit will get stuck. You must clear swarf as you go. It's too easy and tempting to keep going and not clear swarf out, but you must do. Things happen otherwise. There we are. Um, no, it wasn't smoke, by the way. It was steam. You get that very often. You can get smoke quite easily. You leave that drill bit in there for too long. It can cause all sorts of problems. Um, you've got a lovely heap of tinder underneath the lathe, so be careful with that. Right then, so back to that little quarter-inch bowl gouge, a little six-mil bowl gouge. We now shape the inside. And I'm going to slow down a little bit. I've just come out of those... Two recorded videos for you, and there's a huge amount of content in those. A lot, lot of things to do on that project. So it's all been a bit of a rush. Now I'm still in that rush mood, so I'm going to calm down and take some questions, have a sip of coffee. Yes. Um, so first one from Mark. It's not really a question, but um, he's saying that he makes and sells flowers, um, telling customers to use them as supports for the flowers their partners buy them and he gets really good comments back so you've got uh, mark he makes lots of flowers excellent um jenny's asking would it be okay to have the blank just long enough to make two flower heads on the same blank in for the one that i'm doing i find that a bit too long because we then start to get vibration as we start to do this next bit hollow this one out um, I get where you're coming from, but it, there's, there's so much movement in it if you do that. I would need to probably be another couple of inches longer here. And so that's the only thing. We're, we're now heading into end grain um, areas. Maybe if you've got a, a really, really, really big lathe, you know, one of the big brutes, then yes, no problem. But um, this is, for me, this is a fairly large lathe. Um, and you get that, that resonance come through the bit, the, the, the timber. So I wouldn't, Jenny, no. Okay, for the minute. Right, let's clean that outside up, back up in speed. And just... This is now basic. It's almost like a box, turning a box. You're just going down through the end grain. All the mouth of a little vase, that sort of thing. Let's go one more cut down through here. And then if you do have something like, I don't know, a box scraper, fantastic. I'm going to use just a little regular round nose scraper. So if you've got a box scraper already, the negative rate one, brilliant. That's, that's, that's absolutely fantastic for this sort of project. Get in there and gently scrape away. If you haven't, if you've got a round, just a regular round nose like I have here, equally as good. A little bit more aggressive. Right. 
Right, let's just stop and have a pinch. Don't be tempted to keep the lathe running and do this. Make sure you stop the lathe. Yeah, well, that's fine. In terms of thickness, I'm happy with it to there. I just want to round the bottom over a little bit. There we are. Um, we will be putting a further hole in the bottom also to take the... I don't want to do that yet because it's going to weaken the piece. Um, we now need to start thinking about marking and creating those petals. So um, I'm just going to... A bit of guesswork here. Um, from experience, I'm putting my first mark in there, my second mark in here. What this is for, the first one, we're now going to zigzag, not zigzag, put little diamonds in, in here to create those petals. Um, and so I need to divide this up into four sections. And this is just an easy way to, to get those diamond um, sections going. I'll show you in a minute. Yes, Ben, <clears throat> another question. So we've got a few questions in, Cohen. Um, first one from Sleeping Dog. Um, he was late in, so he missed the intro. What's the wood species here? Um, or will pretty much any species work well enough? Yeah, pretty much anything will work. I've chosen a pale timber because I want to color it. And I don't want uh, the, the color of the timber um, detracting from the vibrant colors of the of the stain that I'm using. However, you could keep not stain it at all and just use the color from the timber in a bunch of flowers. And that would look quite cool as well, especially if you mix them up. Like I say, have um, the petals one color and have like a, a paler stamen or a darker stamen in the middle, for instance. That would look cool. And then Maureen's um, got a question here. Um, the keyless drill chuck yes. um, that you were using, is it one piece or is it a, a taper and a separate chuck? Yeah. So, well, all um, drill chucks I know of, whether they're um, keyless or key, they all come with a separate taper. Um, now, that taper does depend on the drill chuck. Some can be B16. Um, some can be, I think it's B42. Um, all sorts of different tapers here. Um, and, of course, most tapers will change, whether it's a one, two or three um as well so yeah they, they will be different you have to know what we i generally buy the chucks with um the taper and you tap the taper in um that's certainly how we as a company sell them um, and usually how you buy them and usually um called narba would you arbor, would yeah, so, yeah that's absolutely it? chuck and arbor so the arbor being the the the, ta the most taper bit and then Maria's asking, what angle is your standard round nose scraper ground to? Standard? Oh, Maria, I'm not, if I'm honest, I'm not entirely sure. I would have said it's probably about, I would have said it's about 80, about 80 degrees. So, um, and we're measuring from the top to the angle here. So that angle is around about 80. It's not, it's just off the 90. So, 75 to 80 degrees, I would have thought. The further back towards 45, the more aggressive they become. Until you get to 45, then you start going the other way and they start calming down again, like a skew chisel, for instance. But, yeah. And then I think there's a bit of a crossed wire on this question, Colin. We've got um, Robert here. He said the other day when Jason was doing his what um, gouge demo, he said that you uh, couldn't use a diamond wheel on a Tormek um, for high-speed steel tools um any particular reason for high speed steel tools the diamond wheel on a dry grinder for high speed steel tools is what he was referring to um so cbn on a dry grinder for high speed steel tools if you're using diamond on a dry grinder that's that's not intended for high speed steel however if you're using diamond on a tormek absolutely no problem whatsoever and then a question from david um he says, "Hi, all. Cohen, is there a set of chucks that, uh, sorry, set of chuck jaws that you would suggest as a first addition to your chuck?" I would always go C jaws. C jaws are these. Okay, lovely. Yeah, C jaws. They have a dovetail on the outside, and they've got a little gripper section on the inside. These are always the one I'm going to go to straight away when you first buy a chuck, whether that's a one one four, a one hundred and eighty. Um, purely because all the other accessories fit that, whether you're going to use a faceplate ring, um, a screw chuck, the eccentric spiraling chuck, they all fit in here. And the amount of times I'm using faceplate rings for things like um, uh, sanding discs, push plates, 
they've all got faceplate rings on. So those C jewels are really valuable um, and, and used constantly. After that, it really does depend on your turning, what you what sort of style you're into. Now, beside me are my favorite jewels or the ones I use most of the time. And things like the the one one twos uh, are really important to me. G, um, the uh, gripper type G, uh, G are really important to me. Um, nylon jaws, wood plate jaws as well, because um, for offset turning and, and those sorts of things. So yeah, starting with the C's, um, and then yeah, then it's just got to go into your style of turning. And then Ken G's asking, what sort of thickness of uh, sorry, what wall thickness are you going for here? Ooh, ooh, I don't know. I would say probably, probably not quite. Now let's go old money. Three sixteenths, four four mil, four four to four and a half mil. How about that? I reckon. Yeah. Right. The layout. So look what I've done. That's about twenty five mil, about an inch from top to there. This is about half an inch, about twelve mil. I'm then just going to look down the, the end and I'm going to divide this up into three, six, nine, and 12 o'clock. All right, so into quarters. And then I want to just mark that on the outside. You can use your indexing head if you want to. It's a little bit over accurate for what we're doing but look, now i've got the markings on the outside here i'm then going to go halfway between those and do another line and then we're going to join those lines up There we are. So you can see, hopefully, you can see where we are with that. So I'm just doing lots of lots of triangles, I suppose. Now we're going to cut. So where's my saw? A little pull saw we're going to use. Um, let's go. So I'm going to cut this one first, the awkward one. I'm going to get right in the way of all the cameras. So we got the startings of our tulip. We're now going to cut down to the second line, to this one. There we are. So that's all the cutting done. Now... It's a little bit more laborious because now we need to start sanding. So look what I've done. I've just cut a little strip oh, just before we start. Yes, questions, Ben. So it looks like you're just about to answer one. Um, first one from Steve. He says he has some um, some live centers from his old one Morse taper lathe. 
Um, his new lathe is 2MT. Um, is there a way to change the Morse taper from one to two so it doesn't have to buy all new centers? Yeah, you can get what you call a, what we call a sleeve. So a Morse taper sleeve, and you're going from two to one or one to two, whatever, however they describe it. But yeah, that sleeve just goes over the, your Morse taper. It's got an internal one Morse taper, external two Morse taper. Um, yeah. And then Sol said they were too busy reading the chat and missed if you had sanded the... Um, your tulip before cutting it so if you're going to sand the inside do it before this stage so i don't want to put my finger in there now so do it when it's in its solid state and use a, a 100 grit or 150 you don't have to go you know overboard on that i'm not going to do it now because it's it's horrible it's sharp and I'll, I'll get my finger caught so um if you want to before we cut those petals off so yeah all right now look i'm cutting my rb paper up but if you're lucky enough to have one of these, okay, abrasive strips, then this is already cut into a lot of inch um, sections. So go for the coarse section there. And that's going to go inside. And so what we're doing is blending over the corners. Because the, the way we've done it, we're going to have a sort of like a, a hard edge just on that spot there. So by doing this, and don't forget you've got to do both sides. Turn them over. Do the other side. Bill's asking if you could use the mesh strips for that, Cohen. Yeah, exactly. No problem at all with those. Yeah, exactly the same thing. I think they're they're actually um, abrasive on both sides, so even better. There we are move that to one side now that's not finished we need to carry on i'm just going to go a slightly larger bit of timber and just carry on your sanding what i want to do is round these edges over and take off any sharp edges you might have on the points so at the moment i had the lathe locked up i'm just going to take the lock off Go, just round things off, tidy them up, get away any horrible sharp points. Okay, that's all I do. You carry on, make it really, really good. Carry on as long as you want to, to make that look, you know, really, really good and get rid of all those horrible sore marks and things like that. But what we'll do now before I start sanding is take a little bit more of this away. To do that, we're going to use the spindle gouge.
I'm going down to about three eighths here, about 10 mil. I want to leave enough strength um, to be able to sand. There we are. I think that'll do us, actually. Let's just stop. Let's stop everything a minute. I'm going to turn the dust extraction on. Turn the dust extraction on and externally sand that piece. Um, we'll start with a coarse one. Start with a 100. Work our way through. Watch your fingers here. So bend that paper around. Get rid of all those pencil marks. There we are, so 150, and then 240. Two forty grit. That's nice. It finishes well. So I'm just going to have a final check over, take out any horrible burrs that might be in there. A little bit there. And we can add some color. So what I'm using here, I've got the SP50 airbrushes. I've got all my colors lined up. Okay, just as a little, just to demonstrate what I've got. So we've got a series here. Oh, I've got six, seven colors. I've got a gray, a black, a lovely blue. We've got our green, our forest green. Then we've got yellow, orange, and the coral red. So we're going to play around. I really like that um, this color here. So we're going to um, recreate this one. We're going to use the three colors, uh, yellow, orange, and the red. You could say, well, why don't you just use red and bleed over the yellow? Well, we're going to. But to get that depth of orange, this is something I learned from doing the um, Viking Sunset Bowl. Actually, the three colors do make a big difference. So that's the one we're going to do. And then we'll look at the stems as well. we still got to do the stems, by the way. I haven't forgotten about that. Yes, Ben. So we've got a, a few questions come in. Um, first one's from Catherine. We're going back to the um, the wedding goblet. What kind of size of blank would you recommend for a, a, a wedding goblet? I, I honestly don't know. Um, uh, depend whatever whatever you wanted to make size wise. Again, I'd need to research because I'm not overly familiar um, with that that type of goblet. So have a look on the internet. Um, I would have said it's no different to, you know, a, a regular goblet size, to be, to be quite honest. And I would say start with a three by three, um, by about seven, eight inches long. So three by three, um, in thickness, seven, eight inches long. And that I'm guessing would work unless there's a different style. I'm not sure. And Bill's asking, what are the chances of snapping the tips off here? If you touch them with your finger or with a tool yes absolutely they will snap off but the grain's running up the piece so the strength is running that way so in terms of um, snapping the tip off you're you're working with the strongest part of the timber as opposed to the weakest if the grain was running this way it'd be dead easy they'd probably fall off just by doing that you know so it is the strongest part um, that i'm using there and jenny's asking how would you apply the color if you if you do not yet have an airbrush um if you don't have an airbrush you could um you could go solid color to, i mean to get the blend this is what an airbrush does it, it gives you that graduation um so to get the fine blend the, the airbrush is the only way you can use the atomizers the the that you you know the puff atomizers but they're a much bigger um uh, 
particle that comes out so you don't get that lovely fine mist um, that comes out. It's the only way I know, if I'm honest with you, so airbrushes, airbrushes are used to, for that graduation. Um, I say apply it by brush or anything, but you will get hard lines. That's the only issue. Right, dust extraction on, and we're going to apply red first. We're going to get the inside of that really red. So the compressor goes on. I've got my little airbrush compressor down beside me. Um, we're going to go coral red. Lay speed down just a wee bit. Then we'll go orange, just on that halfway point. And notice I've come away a little bit. I don't want such a hard line. And then we'll go yellow. Now we're gonna go fairly close down the bottom, just so I can get right in there, then back off as I come around the outside and allow the ink to spray over the other two. So one last thing, one last little job to do on that particular piece is we're gonna drill, I'm using four mil dowel, so I'm just gonna drill a little four mil hole up through the middle. And that will allow us then to put our stems in. I'll just stop the lady just one more time and now we can think about um, passing this one off. I'm going to do that with a skew but look the lovely colours you get those graduations they just fade away um, it's a really nice uh, medium to work with. Yes Ben um, So all our lovely um, our lovely viewers have been giving us great um, suggestions on how we could do it without an airbrush uh, so thank you everyone um, Cliff's got a question here. Are the dyes applied thinned or undiluted? Undiluted, straight out the jar. Yeah. So do, using the skew just to slice. We've got a four mil hole down the, down the center, don't forget. Now, with a little bit of care, gently support the flower. Look, I've got bare arms. Nothing's going to dangle into the chuck. My rings are off, so nothing's going to catch. There we are. That comes away. Let me just pair. I've got a little bit of wood waste there. I just want to pair away. And... Bit of sand here with the, the fine abrasive, and then we just go go over that top with the airbrush. So I'm going to use the yellow. I pop that there a second, two seconds. Just to cover over that little bit of pale timber. And let's just very briefly look at the stem. So let's grab one of these stems. What I've done, so this is just plain beach dowel. Um, and what I've done with this piece here is literally 
got some boiling water, stood them in boiling water, and then wrapped them around a bowl blank. Okay, and just left them there for 24 hours. And it retains that nice little bend. And then they simply just pop on. So, four mil hole. And there. Again, we've got off little flower, little bent flower. So that'll add to the vase. There we are. Nice little angle. All right. There we are. So we'll come back to that one in a minute. Let me show you. Let's have a little bit of scooters or practice before we disappear. Um, if you didn't fancy those, if they look a bit too big for you, which they're not, they're only small, you make them whatever size you want to. Um, let's have a look at some skew cut um, flowers. Whilst I'm changing stuff on the lathe, Ben's going to ask a couple of questions. So a question here from Roy. Um, he's asking, would you see timber before or after spraying? Uh, after spraying. After spraying. So, um, again, use something like the clear sealer from Chromacraft, which is basically a doesn't make sense when I say it, but it's a clear dye. So it's the same solution, but without the color in it. Um, and that gives a, a barrier between that and everything else. Alternatively, use an acrylic um, uh, lacquer, uh, something like the chestnut one that I've got up here. Let me just grab it. Or the Chromacraft clear lacquer. They're both acrylics. Okay. Um, and then spray that over the top and you'll be well away. You could put over the top, you could spray on a sanding sealer. Just be a little bit careful. Anything that you're not going to spray on, anything you're going to wipe on, you very often will take off your, your wood dyes and stains. So um, spraying is, for me, the way forward. And then a question from Roy. He's asked, uh, sorry, from Martin, this one. He's saying, hi, is, this, is that spirit stain you're using, please? It is a spirit stain, yes. Yeah, it's the Chromacraft wood dye, um, which, yes, it is a spirit base. Maria's asking, how about some petals on the old, uh, sorry, some leaves on the on the stem? There, yes, I'm sure there are a way we could do that, Maria. Um, I suspect you could turn several at a time, couldn't you? Nice thin piece and then just cut them to shape. Um, Benjamin's asking... Do you ever use a bedan? Um, no, a beading and parting tool I'll use, which is a double-sided version of a bedan. Um, so I'm using this one quite a lot. I used, I used to use this one to teach when we'd done lots and lots of courses. You can go to number three there, Ben. Um, when we'd done lots and lots of courses, we used to use this one to teach. Um, if people are a little bit twitchy about using the skew chisel, use a beading and parting tool. A bedan, for everyone else that uh, is running sure what we're talking about, um, is a single-sided version of the same thing. Um, and in fact, let me just show you. This is not one, but it's got a similar shape. This is Jason's um, box refining tool. But if you imagine that sharp on both ends, instead, instead of having a negative rake, um, that would be a bedan, so it's a single single um, side. Um, no, I don't. I uh, I'm use my beading and parting tool or skew chisels or parting tools, but um, I don't use a bedan. And then the maker of chippings is just, um, could you remind them of what the stalk was made from? Uh, beach dowel. So it's plain beach dowel, and that's, that's bought beach dowel, um, four millimetres. Um, but yeah, whatever size you want. Four mil bends quite nicely. It's beach, so which is is good for be, um, for bending. You can either steam it or do what I done, just submerge it, submerge it in boiling water, and then that makes it pliable. Um, and then just um, elastic band or tape it round something circular whilst it's um, drying off. Right, some quick heel cuts. So this is a piece of um, lime. Okay, in the same chuck, I'm using the little OD um, chuck. Um, so a bit of lime. We'll use the signature skew. So the splay skew, the Conway signature skew. We'll get that lathe running nice and fast. Forwards and backwards, forwards and backwards. Just take away your waist. Just to get us down to around. There we are. Then in terms of flowers, we're going to use the heel of the skew and we're going to create little, little flares. Okay. So I'm going to push with the heel.
Then we can park down the back. Don't go too close to your little flares. This one's going to be a little sunflower, I think. So dust extract uh, compressor on. We're going to use our, let's go dark to start with. So if I go a little bit, this is going to sound weird, but we need a little bit of black. There we are. Then a little bit of red. No, let's go orange, sunflower, what am I talking about? Then, of course, the yellow. Don't forget the back. And that one can be parted. I want to show you the uh, daffodil. Daffodils are quite cool as well. And when you get a few of these together, and I use... Um, Florist wire, so florist tying wire. There we are. One, Let's do a little daff. I'll put them all together in a minute. A little bit high with that tool rest. a little bit of the let's go red in the middle and the rest will do orange i want to show you another timber as well good if you are into demonstrating and craft shows that sort of thing these are great to demonstrate with while people are walking by. You can throw them out into the crowd, get everybody coming over to see what you're doing. So that's lime. Okay, so a few of those together. One millimeter drill bit in the back. Florist wire um, as stems. You can get green florist wire as well, which makes them even a little bit more authentic. But they're quite cool little practice pieces with the skew. I'm going to use a little bit of um, pine now. That was lime. That was dry lime. Wet birch sticks work really well. So you think about pea sticks, that sort of thing, or bean sticks. Um, the wetter the better you can get big frills coming from those sorts of things yes Ben so, um, oh. so Mark's asking who sweeps up all the shavings was it you me Jason well it's me it's <laughs> me I'm the only one that cleans up my shavings yeah unfortunately <laughs> Ben cleans his I clean mine and Jason cleans Jason's <laughs> it seems um, to be a, a, a working um, pattern that one and then Phil said um, the seen you make these heel cut flowers before. Um, his always shed the feathered pieces. Would that be a wood species issue? Probably, yeah. I don't know how this is going to work actually, so we'll see. Um, timbers that work really well lime, good quality, dense lime, uh, birch, hazel is a good one as well. Um, sometimes uh, maple will work nicely. Um, and I have seen pine, so I just wanted to give this a go just to see how this is going to act on uh, for us. I've done trees with pine, and that's been fine. Yes, Ben. And Keith is asking, what's the depth of cut when you're making these small flowers that peel back? 
the peel back it was a fraction of a millimeter probably about 0.25 of a mil i would have thought uh maybe well i say maybe 0.5 so there we are forward and back That's working all right. I know just because I can, I'm just going to do a little tree. This is something that I, I love demonstrating, these little trees. Um, but it's the same technique for the flowers. Trees are, are really pretty. Um, we're going to use the forest green. Great practice for skew chisels as well. So you can see where we're going with this. Look, the shape that we're getting This nice sort of rounded over cone nice little point at the top a little bit more pointed i think and then we're going to peel cut so lay speed down a little bit use the heel and push back and then push back. Oh, it's flaring lovely. Keep it there. Let's go down with the uh, spindle gouge. No sanding required on these. You're not going to sand any of this. Obviously, we want to keep this lovely frill up here. So we're going to go in with the um, the forest green now. part that one off now just be a little bit careful you don't want to wrap your hand around this because obviously things are going to fall apart if you do that so nice gentle grip not even a grip nice gentle support and i'm just touching the piece but not gripping there we are there's our lovely little Little hill cut Christmas tree. The reason I wanted to demonstrate that is just to show you a slightly longer piece, but the flowers are all done in exactly the same way. Those frills are the star, and the color makes them jump. All right. So, yes, Ben, you've got a few more questions there. Yeah. First question here from Bill How do you enter the wood without catching? The heel. So, sometimes if you're practice in the skew chisel and you're doing some planing cuts if you get too close to the heel as you're planing you'll notice that the burr will come up and that's what we're trying to get when we do these heel cuts you lead in with the the point of the heel um, and that immediately sends the skew chisel underneath the fibers and you can start pushing up the trick is then once you've done that to keep that bevel rubbing as you push it back um, practice on wet timber you get a much better burr um, with wet timber so, so go to your garden nursery or your garden center wherever you get your um your garden supplies from and ask for some some wet hazel sticks um, and you usually get them in in sort of 
you know, bundles of about 10 for your, for growing your peas and beans up. Um, but yeah, you've got loads and loads of chances there to practice to skew with those. They're no, generally not a huge amount of money either. And then Mark's asking, have you ever made any of the large trees seen on the carousels? Um, so the ones with the curl, um, the, the, the curled leaves, I haven't. Um, so they're done by pushing a, a, car, a carpentry chisel back and creating a curl. And then they, they pull those curls out to make them a little bit bigger. No, I haven't. Have a look online. Um, if you put, um, especially put Seafern and Obenhow, um, Christmas trees from that area, you'll get some some videos come up of them making those. I haven't. They they look really, really cool. I've got some. I've collected some of myself on my trips over there, but I haven't made them yet. And then there's <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> I caught in my throat. Um the the um the Christmas word keeps coming up here. Yeah. You notice know, so I've never mentioned that old <laughs> demonstration. It's Easter. <laughs> I'm allowed to say Easter. <laughs> right then okay guys thank you ever so much for that there we are you got some uh some ideas for easter gifts if you haven't uh spoiled everybody with easter eggs already um there we are we're gonna uh, just a little bunch of our easter flowers and uh and and an easter tree and some little flare cut uh, or, or skew cut um, flowers as well. Have fun with it. This is what we're here for. Um, this is what turning is all about. It's having a bit of fun and it's just making nice things that you enjoy making. Uh, and that's why I like to do it. So uh, thanks again for stepping or stopping by. And um, don't forget, I say this every single time. If you like what you see, give us a thumbs up, um, subscribe and share the channel as much as possible. Um, and uh, look forward to next week. I've already started next week's demonstration that's the viking sunset bowl um so make sure you stop by and watch that one but thanks for for watching bye bye